if you haven't seen The Big Sick, I, I highly encourage it. I think it's an entertaining and interesting movie. It's based on a true story about an immigrant family from Pakistan. Uh, Kumail's parents brought him and his brother over to America when they were kids uh, to experience the American dream. Predictably, Kumail uh, becomes thoroughly Americanized. He leaves his Pakistani roots and his Muslim religion behind. And when he finally admits this to his parents, uh, they disown him. While they eventually reconcile later in life, like I said, it's a true story, uh, the movie does end with Kumail and his parents not speaking. It can be hard. It can be hard to accept one another in our families. I mean, families are places of tradition and expectation and convention. Uh, but it can be hard. I mean, how many children come home from college with big announcements to make, not quite sure how their parents are going to take them? How many families have been cleaved in two uh, the past several years as politics and cultural events just exposed rifts that just could not be bridged? Families should be places of acceptance where love overcomes whatever differences we might have, but too often they are places of, of judgment and rejection. Now, if that's true in families, how much more true is it in churches? Churches are families. Churches are gatherings of brothers and sisters bound together by blood, the blood of Christ. We, I mean, we meet together for, for dinner and communion. We, we do life together as siblings. We raise kids together. We go to each other's funerals together. Churches should be places where love and grace allow us to bridge our differences, but so often churches are not that. Like families, churches can also be places of rejection and judgment. And this breaks God's heart. It is the ultimate hypocrisy. And it compromises our witness to the world of a God who loves and accepts us regardless of who we are. For if we have any hope of sharing with the world a God who loves people enough to accept them, we, we have to ourselves be a group of people that can accept each other. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about what it means to accept one another. We're in the middle of a series here at Rooftop. It's called The One Another's. And as we've talked about, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus Christ, doesn't just mean to be saved from death and sin by Jesus, although it does mean that, but it also means something else. It means to be called into a new community, a new family that does life together in ways different from how the world does. Now, the Bible's general command on how to do this is blank one another. And that blank is filled in with all kinds of relational commands, 59 of them, in fact. The Bible says to love one another. The Bible says to honor one another. The Bible says to confess your sins to one another, to encourage one another. And the Bible also says to accept one another. As Paul puts it in the book of Romans, accept one another then. Just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Now, the Greek word for accept here uh, is a really fun, important, interesting word. The Greek word is, is proslambano. Turn to your neighbor and say proslambano. That's right. You got to do it with your hands though. Proslambano. Very good. Very good. Uh, so proslambano, it, it literally means to take to oneself, to take in the arms, to, to take aside to oneself. It's Oftentimes translated accept, and if it's not translated accept, sometimes it's translated, you know, to receive or to welcome. But proslambano means more than that. It's not a passive verb as like I sit back and like wait for you. It's a more active verb. It means to take, to actively accept. I'll define proslambano uh, this way. To proslambano someone means to gladly take someone into your arms, into your heart, regardless of who they are. And this is part of what it means to be a Christian. It means to take people into your life. It's also part of what it means to be a church, especially a growing one. <clears throat> In our mission to share Jesus with the world, we are called to accept other people who come from many different backgrounds, have all kinds of pasts, all kinds of stories, all kinds of looks, all kinds of smells, all kinds of sins. We're called to take them in. 
You probably know this, but Jesus himself built his ministry this way by accepting sinners. I mean, read, read the, the, the gospel and you will read story after story of Jesus taking to himself people that the world would forget. Tax collectors, prostitutes, drunkards, Roman soldiers, Samaritans, children, lawyers, people with communicable diseases. In fact, Jesus spent so much time with so many off-colored people that he developed a little bit of a reputation. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, they said about him. Here's a drunkard, drunkard and a, a glutton, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And a little bit of a reputation for taking too many people in. <laughs> Building on this legacy, uh, the New Testament churches also became collections of sinners and rejects. The, the book of Acts describes churches basically coming together from the scum of the earth. But as you can expect, even among the scum, hierarchies developed. The human instinct to judge and divide took hold. This is why so much of Paul's instruction to the, to the churches in the New Testament involves reminding early Christians, you've got to accept each other the same way Christ accepted you. But this can be a hard sell in churches. We forget that we are sinners too, and, and we start worrying about the integrity and the purity of our community. You know, what will happen to us if we let like people like that in? We start worrying about the children. Oh no, the children. We can't let the children think that it's okay to like live like that. As a result, so many churches they, they lose the sense of acceptance and grace on which they were founded by like Jesus. The friend of sinners. I remember a story told uh, many years ago, well, not many years ago, in a, in a book, um, which he wrote many years ago, but it's uh, by Philip Yancey, What's So Amazing About Grace. Philip Yancey, one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite books. And I've shared the story with you, but it, and it's, it's graphic, but it bears repeating. A friend of Yancey's, he actually works with the Down and Out in Chicago. And a prostitute came to him once in dire straits. Prostitute, hungry, homeless, sick, addicted to drugs, unable to provide for her two-year-old daughter. And through tears, uh, the woman eventually confessed to him that she had been renting out her daughter to men for sex. Over the course of the conversation, the man actually asked if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. And he says he will never forget the look of pure, naive shock on the woman's face. Church, she cried. Why would I ever go to church? I was already feeling terrible about myself. This is a quote. They would just make me feel worse. They would just make me feel worse. How did we get this reputation? How do we Christians get a reputation, not as a place where even the worst sinners can find hope and acceptance, but as a place of judgment where people are terrified to go? Because we'll just make them feel worse. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know it is just not what Jesus had in mind. And it's not the reputation we want Rooftop to have. We want to be known throughout the city as a place that not only accepts each other, but can accept anyone anyone. How do we do that, though? How do we accept people? Well, <clears throat> let's look, look back to Paul's words <clears throat> to the Romans. Here's what he says. He says, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. So I think Paul actually helps us understand how we can actually become an accepting community. How should we do that? in the same way that Christ accepts us. So how do we accept one another? Well, what's the real question? How does Christ accept us? How does Christ accept me? That's the question that I actually want to talk about with you this morning. And I have five brief answers that I want to share with you. How does Christ accept us? First, Christ accepts us gladly. Gladly. I told you earlier that the word proslambano is sometimes translated receive or welcome, but that's inadequate because the word is more active than that. It means to take to yourself 
eagerly. So when we think of Christ, you know, receiving us, we, we think of him sitting in a, a, a large throne in, in the throne room of heaven while we like nervously uh, uh, approach. We, we think of Jesus up there sitting like up there, like you may enter. And we're like crawling forward. Okay, here I come. That is not proslambanoing. That is not how Jesus proslambanos us. Jesus is at the door, out in the courtyard, walking us forward. It's okay, it's okay. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. I'm glad to take you forward into the throne room of God. We can show how we get this by how we greet each other on Sunday morning. Like I said, there's 59 one another commands in the Bible. We're not going to get to all of them. Um, Greet one another is actually very common one another command in scripture, we're not going to get to it, but it's worth mentioning because it's mentioned repeatedly. What does it mean to greet one another though? And and why does the Bible tell us like five or six or seven times, greet one another, greet one another? Why is it so important? Well, to greet one another means to do the work together to make one another feel welcome and noticed. Greet one another, not let the greeting team give you a program at the door. Not what the Bible says. That means to look people in the eye, use their name, tell them we are glad you're here. It means to see someone pull up in the parking lot, run out to the parking lot, (laughs) open the door, oh my gosh, you made it. We are glad you're here. Let me carry in. Our rooftops teachers, by the way, our rooftops teachers do this so well. I've seen it happen. I see it happen every Sunday morning. Our rooftops teachers, they know, they know that kids are nervous being here. They know it is a very strange experience for a kid to walk into a weird room with new people. But Aaron and her teachers do this so well. Robin does this so well. They welcome each one of those kids with big smiles. We are so glad that you are here, they say. We're going to have so much fun with you this morning, they say. We're not just going to tolerate you. We're we're not just going to put up with you so that your parents can enjoy church. We are glad you're here. We are glad you're here with your your poopy diaper (laughs) and your snotty nose and your limited vocabulary. (laughs) We are glad you're here. We can learn a lot from our rooftops teachers. Because, you know, big people in this room, the big people in this room, they can be just as nervous. They can be just as snotty. They can be just as poopy. I smelled your stuff. You can be just as poopy. But we are glad you're here. We are glad you're here. We're going to have so much fun together this morning. Christ receives us. Somebody just said something really funny. You want, okay, all right. I don't know where your mommy is, but your father is right here. That's right. Christ accepts us gladly. Secondly, Christ accepts us globally. By the way, this morning's message is brought to you by the letter G. (laughs) Christ accepts us globally. So the book of Acts in the New Testament tells the story of the early church. And as you might know, uh, early followers of Jesus, they were mostly Jewish. Even Jesus himself was Jewish. Now, eventually, non-Jews or Gentiles, they started coming to faith, and the early Jewish Christians had had mixed feelings about these non-Jewish believers being allowed into the kingdom of God with, you know, their lifestyles and their traditions. So the first apostles, they had this big debate, and it became obvious to them that Jesus had come into the world, darn it, to save more than Jews. And as the apostle Peter, himself Jewish, explained, God, this is in the book of Acts, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted Proslambano the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. So God did not discriminate between people or believers. He accepted them globally, wherever they were from. 
As Peter's already said in Acts, he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation. Pros Lombanos, from every nation, the one who fears him and does what is right. God does not show favoritism. He accepts from every nation globally the one who fears him. Now, that sounds so nice, right? That'll preach, right? Sounds so perfect. Amen, we might think. Won't he do it? We might say. Here's the thing, though. Who said those words? Peter. Oh, Peter. (laughs) Peter. Maybe you know this about Peter. Peter was one of uh, Jesus' lead disciples, And uh, Peter had a hard time following through. Uh, Peter was, as they say, a a recidivist. A little bit of a backslider. As you read the New Testament, you learn that Peter didn't always stick with his words. In fact, one time, Peter went to this church and he refused to eat with Gentile people. He thought they were too dirty. The Apostle Peter, follower of Jesus, author of 1 and 2 Peter, the one who just said that God does not show favoritism, refused to eat with an entire group of people because they came from the wrong side of the tracks. The Apostle Paul had to confront him to his face. It's one of the more dramatic moments in the New Testament. My point is, it's easy to say that God accepts all people from all nations. But do we mean it? When we see people from other nations, do we stay on our side of the room? Do we go out of our way to receive to ourselves people who are different than us? I mean, we'll tell ourselves, sure, we'll tell ourselves that God loves the people down in Mexico or the people in North City or in rural Missouri, but will we go out of our way to spend time with them? Will we learn their languages? Will we learn their culture? Do we mean it? It's actually my third point. Not only does Christ accept us globally, but Christ accepts us generously. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say that God did to show the world that he accepted the Gentiles? Peter didn't eat with them. That's how he showed the world. But what does the Bible say God did to show the world that he accepted the Gentiles? He gave them a gift. As Acts says, God who knows the heart showed, he showed that he accepted the Gentiles by giving the Holy Spirit to them. So it's easy to say that God accepts anybody and so should we, but God doesn't just say it. God generously shows it. God gave them the Holy Spirit, his invisible presence and power. He gave himself to these outsiders to show the world that he loved them too. I remember after George Floyd uh, was killed a couple years ago, we started talking a little bit differently about race in this country. And I know a lot of my black brothers and sisters would say, finally, you know, you're finally starting to get it. And I acknowledge that plenty of white Christians were very late to the conversation. And I wanted to be part of the conversation too, just to learn. <clears throat> but I didn't want to just be part of the conversation. I wanted to do something. I mean, lots of people were sharing opinions and talking about it on social media. And there was all kinds of virtue signaling. But I wanted to do something. I just didn't know what to do, though. So, for starters, I just found an organization that I could give money to. Organizations need money. It's the Equal Justice Initiative. They work for fairness in our criminal justice system. I didn't want to just say that black people matter to me and to God. I wanted to show it. That's what it means to accept one another. It means to show it through acts of generosity. In fact, maybe there's somebody in your life, in your church, in your family, who needs to see your acceptance. You might want them in your life. You might in your heart of hearts accept them. But do they know it? Have you shown it to them? Have you shown your child recently that you accept them no matter who they are? Or have you just kind of told yourself and reassured yourself of that? What about your neighbor? Your neighbor might need to see it. You love them, you tell them that you accept them, but have you invited them over? We're actually trying to do that a little bit better here at Rooftop. I'm speaking of our kids' ministry. Aaron and her leaders are putting together a team that can be a bit more responsive to special needs kids. It's easy to say that Christ accepts all kinds of kids, but how can we show it to them? 
How does Christ accept us? Gladly, globally, generously. Fourthly, Christ accepts us graciously. In the New Testament, there's another story of acceptance that I also think is pretty instructive for us. The book of Philemon <clears throat> tells the story of an indentured employee or slave named Onesimus who has escaped his boss or master. The apostle Paul meets this young man and he actually sends him back to his master, Philemon. It's a complicated situation. I don't have time to get into all the details, but Anyway, Paul, so Paul sends a letter to Philemon with Onesimus. And in this letter, Paul writes, If you consider me a partner, Philemon, accept, proslambano, Onesimus back as you would accept me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Basically, accept your brother back in spite of what he's done. Charge his wrongdoings to my account. I'm not asking you to think that he's the perfect employee. He's not the perfect employee. But we're Christians. Be gracious. This is important because when we accept one another, we're not expecting others to be perfect. In fact, far, far from it. I mean, the book of Hebrews says God chastens. God chastens everyone he accepts as his child. We can still accept people and still recognize them as sinners who need forgiving and, and correcting. Honestly, the world doesn't understand this. The world doesn't understand that we can accept people without affirming their identities or their moral choices. I can accept you into my life and still think homosexuality is sinful. I can accept you into my family and still think that premarital sex is not God's plan. I can even have very strong opinions about those things. The world talks about acceptance. The world tells us that we have to accept people for who they are, but what they actually mean is that we have to affirm who they are. And if we don't, here's the irony, the world won't accept us. Not only will they not accept us, they'll call us bigots. So the world preaches acceptance but won't accept us unless we affirm every part of who they are. But we can still think sin is sin and also love and accept other people. It's a hard balance to maintain, but it's possible. It just takes humility and love and sacrifice. It takes practice, spending time with people who are different than you, following Jesus into the lives of people you don't know, becoming like Christ, a friend of sinners. Now, there is a fine line here, though. I don't want to get lost in the details, but you probably noticed that we're talking this morning about two different types of acceptance, and I think it's important to distinguish between two different types of acceptance. We've talked this morning about what we might call friendly acceptance versus formal acceptance. So all Christians everywhere are called to accept one another in friendly, gracious ways. I mean, take people into your life gladly, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter how they smell. But that is different from formally accepting someone into the body of Christ. Jesus was very good at friendly acceptance. Everybody knew that they could go to Jesus for a hug. But even God in the Bible says that when it comes to being accepted into the kingdom of God, into the waters of baptism, into membership in the body of Christ, we're talking about something else. The standards are higher. Uh, what did Peter say in the book of Acts? He said this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. God accepts everybody, but he only saves those who through faith in Jesus Christ do what is right. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to be perfect. That just means you've got to agree with Jesus about what is right, what righteousness looks like. I get this question all the time about Rooftop. People ask, does Rooftop accept LGBTQ plus people? I get that question all the time. Does Rooftop accept LGBTQ plus people? My answer is always, we intend to. I mean, I will. I will. And if you feel judged by anybody here at Rooftop because of their sexuality, I want to know exactly who they are so I can confront them for their judgmentalism. So we intend to. 
But I'll ask the person who asks, other question, will you accept us? I mean, anybody can come, but we're still going to preach the gospel. And if you want to get baptized, you want to apply for membership, we're going to talk about sin and repentance. Jesus accepts anybody in his arms. He loves all people, but that doesn't mean he doesn't want to chasten you as a sinner. He loves you too much not to. And ultimately, there is no acceptance in the kingdom of God apart from faith in Jesus Christ, who died for our sins so that we could do what is right. How does Jesus accept us? Gladly, globally, generously, graciously, and lastly, Jesus accepts us gloriously. As Paul writes in Romans, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order, in order to bring praise to God. The reason Christ accepts us, the reason we must accept one another is to glorify God in heaven above. Our taking in of sinners into our lives as sinners taken in by God shows the world the love and the grace of the Father. That needs to be a reputation. Prostitutes and sinners need to understand that that's what they can expect if they show up to this church that we will take them in to the glory of the Father. Let me close this morning by sharing another story with you from another one of Philip Yancey's books. You can tell I'm a little bit of a fanboy. Book's called Church, Why Bother? (laughs) Great title. But it's a story about Adolphus. Uh, Yancey, uh, he belonged to an inner city church in, in downtown Chicago that attracted a lot of colorful urban characters. And one of them was named Adolphus. Adolphus was a a Vietnam vet with PTSD from the war and from living as a black man in such a harsh environment as impoverished inner city Chicago. Now, Adolphus had a real hard time holding down a job. He was cast off by his family. Uh, He was in and out of mental institutions, but he was a regular at LaSalle Street Church. Now, as the congregation got to know Adolphus, they realized that when Adolphus was on his medication, things went pretty well. But when he wasn't, he was unpredictable and even threatening. He would listen to rap music on headphones during the sermon. He would hold his hands up during the music and make obscene gestures. Uh, During congregational prayer time, uh, people would shout out prayer requests during congregational prayer time. And the congregation would respond, Lord, hear our prayer. Uh, after each request. <clears throat> One Sunday, Adolphus prayed, Lord, thank God for Whitney Houston and her magnificent body. And the congregation said, Lord, hear our prayer. <laughs> Another Sunday, he thanked God for the huge record contract he had just signed with a big label. The church excitedly responded, Lord, hear our prayer, while those who knew Adolphus knew that he was just at the time delusional. <laughs> But Adolphus was also angry and troubled. Uh, One time he stood up and he threatened to burn down the houses of all the white honky pastors in the church. He threatened to bring an M16 to church the next week and kill everybody. Instead of banning him from the property, which is what would have happened in most congregations, some of the elders of the church took Adolphus under their wing with some of the professionals in their congregation. They frequently took him aside and explained, they proslambanoed him And they explained to Adolphus that it's not appropriate to threaten to kill people at your church. I'm taking this opportunity to explain that to all of you also, just so we're all on the same page, right? (laughs) Not appropriate, threaten to kill. No matter how bad the sermon goes, there's there's a line. (laughs) And Adolphus eventually endeared himself to the congregation. When people found out he walked five miles to church every Sunday, they got some rides going for him. When Adolphus said he wanted to play on the worship team, They gave him an audition, and then realizing he had no talent, let him play his guitar on the side of the stage on the condition that it remained unplugged. This worked fine until Adolphus started gyrating Joe Cocker style across the stage during communion. Eventually, Adolphus even applied for church membership. The elders met with him, rejected him, but agreed to work with him as he learned what it meant to live life as a follower of Jesus. Adolphus pressed on. On the third attempt, he was accepted as a member in the church. He even got married. He learned how to rely on the community to help manage his mental health. That's what it looks like to be an accepting church. 
That's what it looks like to accept one another. To accept one another means to take people into our lives, walk forward with them in grace for as long as they want to go, all the way to the throne room of God. That's how Christ accepts us. I mean, you need to know, you need to know, people, this morning, that we are not too much more impressive than Adolphus. We might find ourselves inspired by this pitiful, persevering man, but we're not too much more. We're sinners. We don't know the half of it. We have mental health problems. We're angry. We're violent. We're deluded. We're unpredictable. We don't know how to do love. We don't know how to do community. We don't know how to do prayer. But God loves us anyway. Jesus came to earth to die for our sins anyway. Jesus took us to himself anyway. Jesus came to be our friend anyway. He did this because no matter who, he, who we are, that's the kind of God we worship. One who accepts us so that we can accept each other.